We're going to hear from Dr. Ed Root. I apologize, I have a problem with names. I'm so sorry. Um, Albert, who is a fellow at the at NIASA, the Institute of Advanced African Studies at the University of Ghana. She further holds the chair of social anthropology at the University of Bayreuth. Here, um, she is the founding member, member of the Africa Multiple, the, the cluster Africa Multiple and the cluster's former vice dean of research and here being University of Bayreuth, I'm assuming. Her research interests, um, interests are on processes of social change with regard to the interdependencies and mutual entanglements of politics and kinship, primarily in West Africa. Her current research topics are generational relations, aging, kinship, the emergence and dynamics of new middle classes, and the global production of illiteracy. Her recent publications are Kinship and Politics, a Reader, <clears throat> which is published by New York Rutledge, 2022, with uh, Tachana Telen. Taylor, thank you. Transfers of belonging. I told you I have problems with names, so please don't be offended. Transfers of belonging, child fostering in West Africa in the 20th century by Brill in 2018. So I hope you all can put your hands together and welcome Dr. Albert, who is going to present for about 45 minutes. And then after that, we will have, we'll take questions. For those of you online, please utilize the chat box. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. I'll be monitoring it so when the conversation comes, we will be ready to speak. Thank you so much. And you're welcome to the Institute. Yeah, thank you uh, very much um, for this very kind introduction. Also for already summarizing what you are going to uh, hear. I hope uh, that not everything has been already <laughs> Yes, uh, I would like also uh, not only to welcome my colleagues uh, along from Yasa, and when I listen to the uh, edition of different research topics, uh, I am actually working on or I'm involved in research projects. Of course, there is one meeting, which is uh, women in politics and increasing women's presence uh, in politics on which I'm actually uh, working here. Uh, sorry, it was a little bit older version. <laughs> and I would also uh, like to welcome the director of uh, Miata, one of the two directors of uh, Miata, Dr. Susan Wanga, and uh, of course, uh, thank uh, Miata to make it possible uh, for me to be here. And uh, many thanks also to the Institute of uh, African Studies here at the University of uh, Ghana. I'm really honored uh, to uh, be here. Um, I'm, well, of course, always, one is always honored when one is invited uh, to give a talk, but in uh, such an eminent and prominent uh, place uh, on the African country, uh, continent, uh, uh, to research on Africa, but also to push forward the agenda of decolonizing African studies, uh, it is of course a special honor for me. Okay, and I thought uh, that, um, I hope that I can handle with the two hands and one who is not. Um, I, uh, yeah, um, open the presentation. So, I start my presentation with a provocative statement. In which direction do I have to go? In that direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I start my presentation with a provocative statement of James Ferguson on welfare regimes in Southern Africa. He wrote, civilization was not a universal entitlement, but the property of a privileged minority and the association of social rights with this attribute was precisely a principle of restriction so that social assistance was available only for the civilized to stabilize the evolution with, with the African extended family, the imagined remedy for the less civilized. So Ferguson's argument is part of his reflection on social security and welfare in African states. And the question behind is, 
However, the state justify the fact that the formal networks and institutions of social welfare, such as health insurance, pension systems, or unemployment policy is in most African studies only for teams of small minorities. And then in this citation, the African extended family appears as, in his words, the imagined remedy for the less civilized West. As an anthropologist by training, I have, so, so to speak, grown up with literature on kinship systems in Africa and their entanglement with political formation, as for instance, the lineage system of the Nua or the web of kinship among the Kalanzi by Maya Fortis to use an example from Ghana. And that was added by literature on the extended family and its important role for microeconomies in African enterprises, for instance. I was therefore surprised when reading that Ferguson talked about the extended family as the imagined remedy for the less civilized spread, of course, in an ironic way. How could it be that the extended family was an imagination? Um, if it even appeared in many constitutions and civil laws, as for instance, that of Ghana, in which it is expressed that the family is seen as the major caretaker for the elder. So what does Ferguson mean when talking about the imagined remedy for the less civilized press? And do and how we have to decolonize this extended family in with, with which arguments and why? My contribution of today tackles these questions by seeking answers from a social anthropological and historically informed perspective. And as you know, social anthropologists are often working intensively local and try to make on the basis of their intensive research in a specific local area an argument that they offer for generalizing or comparative approach. I will therefore invite you in the following to travel with me into my research region in Northern Benin, where my own empirical research is anchored. Seeking answers to the challenge Ferguson offered to us by talking about the extended family as an imagination, I'm in the following tracing the history of the concept of the extended family, and I do that with the help of different kinds of material and sources, oral and written sources, in the hope that we could discuss my argument later in a broader sense. And I will now start with a quotation of Bona, an older woman from the village of Stibor, born in the early 20th century, uh, with whom I had a long and intensive conversation. Bona has never learned French. In 1998, we had a long conversation about the practice of child fostering, for which I was interested at that time. So Bona said, and you have the version in Bartolum, the local language, and I think it's easier to go directly to English. So if you go into a marriage with a man, then you will fetch from your family, which you have, your own thing, in order to keep it, to bring it up. But even if you bear children for him, you will fetch the child of your brother, the child of your younger sister. So this quotation offers many angles for her on her understanding of child fosterage, on which I have interpreted elsewhere. However, when re-listening to the interview some years later, I was astonished to find the word famille, the French famille as a loan word, loan word uh, in the interview. In the middle of an interview conducted entirely in the local language of Bartholomew. Bonna used the French term famille, and even though she repeatedly declared that the practices she described had existed long time before colonialism, she used this French word. This makes it even more surprising Thing that she borrowed the term from the colonial language. Superficially, this could be understood stood as a simple phenomenon of language context. It is not so much surprising that many words originating in other African or in European languages have entered local languages. And I think uh, we all know many examples um, 
here as a local context. So understanding Fami as such a loan word would suggest that what Bonner referred to here was unknown before colonial. However, she also made it very clear that the practices like ch child fostering that she described in this interview had existed long before the French arrived. So what did Fami mean in this conversation? It was first of all those who belong to another and to Bona, which she expressed with the possessive pronoun your, your family. Furthermore, it referred to all of those whom Bona has the right to take in children. This marked the boundaries which she, with the in-laws. So she distinguished her family from that of her in-laws. Their children did not belong to Bona at all, not even the children she bore by herself. So probably the very best translation for family would be extended kin in the broad sense of naturalized bilateral social relations. The way the term is widely used in the discipline of anthropology. However, there's no expression for family, extended family or extended kin in Bonner's own language, Bartonum, as it is also not the case in many other African languages. Well, I was at first surprised to hear, hear her use the term for me. It is not unusual to hear it in everyday conversations all over the country. For me, has men entered in many different local languages in Benin and is frequently used in a broad sense to refer to an unspecified collective category of bilateral kin. Depending on the context, it is sometimes also used to designate a narrower group of us. A very common part of standard and even obligatory everyday greetings is to ask for instance somebody in a family and how's your family. As it does not require a strongly individualized answer, this greeting is frequently expressed in a mixture of local languages in Benin. In Bakumu, for instance, the set phrase would be moon and family, your family. An urban middle class woman might answer that her husband and her children were fine, thus understanding family in the sense of her nuclear family. In conclusion, la famille refers to a sense of belonging in everyday communication that can sometimes mean those one is living with and sometimes larger, larger group of kin. Sometimes it includes the in-laws, but not always all. Depending on the speaker and the concrete context, sharp boundaries are often drawn by one's own family and the in-laws, but not always. But family is often quite uh, used in a very inclusive way and has become today an easy and very widespread element of communicating and carrying on meaningful, but not completely specified social relations. So tracing the history of the term family or family, I argue that the assumption that this extended family is the natural way of self-organizing in Africa and society is too simple. It was introduced by French colonial bureaucratic practice and I'm very sure also by British with their related language of codifying, just judging, counting and registering. These practices were infused with and organized around the idea that the extended family was the key principle of social organization in pre-colonial Africa. Europeans were not aware that there was no term in the local languages that could easily be, be translated as la famille before they arrived. This is surprising because common Euro-American stereotypes of sociability and exchange in the African continent as well as generally shared anthropological or sociological knowledge, suggests that kinship or the extended family formed the main element of social and political organization in pre-colonial Africa. To mention just a few instances of pre-colonial African science societies having been characterized as based on extended kinship over decades, it suffices to remember some important lines and periods of thinking. In structural, functionalist anthropology and African political systems, as well in their large scale research program on kinship and marriage in Africa, 
Maya Fortes and Edward Evans Pritchard argued that stateless societies in the Savannah Belt were organized politically around a kinship based segmentary lineage system. Two decades later, and seemingly far from structural functionalist positions, proponents of modernization theory, such as William Wood, also attached great importance to the extended family. This was framed as an antiquated institution that would be replaced in the process of modernization by the modern nuclear family. But Wood again argued that it would survive longer than elsewhere in Africa, which he considered more traditional than other regions of the world. And I could give much more literature, hint, of course. Um, but even much later, social science research on what is assumed to be a specifically African manner of exercising power still keeps kinship relations and related obligations, such as the redistribution of wealth, as a driving force for social and political action, but also as a source of corruption. Even in the field of economics, researchers interested in studying what is specifically African tend to refer to the kinship network. For instance, a widespread argument holds that African entrepreneurs can accumulate wealth because they are constantly obliged to redistribute it among their relatives. So this notion of African sociability is fundamentally based on extended kinship or family network is omnipresent in the literature, as well as in public discourse. It is often set in contrast, contrast to Western or European politics and sociability, which is imagined to be comparatively free of kinship or free of family by attributing relevant tasks, for instance, of care for the elderly or social security to the state. Such binaries and apparently easy oppositions mirroring the modern traditional dichotomy have been deconstructed uh, for many concepts for a while, but not yet for the field of kinship and family. Situating Fami in the colonial imagery, I argue against the seemingly eternal imagery of Africa as the continent of kinship and the related undertones of backwardness, tradition, or more positively, not effectiveness by the coldness of modernization, which seems to need to pop up again and again in the debate until today. Okay, my first step is now to discuss the Cotimier de Dahomey, which played a major, major role in the invention of the family in Dahomey. I then come to colonial practices of organizing succession. Then I turn to local concepts um, in contested in some way with ideas of family and show that not all of them also existed before colonialism. And uh, then I maybe I briefly talk about the child fostering and then I come to my conclusion. So the cotton the dangle. As it is common knowledge, and I am sure that you all know, the colonial project of conquering and colonizing Africa coincided with the establishment of the discipline of anthropology at the end of the 19th century. That was accompanied by the establishment of kinship as a scientific category and an object of research that called upon modes of classification, a process that Thomas Trautmann has insightfully called the invention of kinship. The new discipline's interest in kinship accompanied the stabilization of difference between civilized and primitive societies and projected divergent sexual practices such as polygamy, liberate marriage, or promiscuity to the so called primitive society. By defined as systems of consanguinity and affinity, kinship relations were at the same time seen as an innate feature of all branches of the human family. It was exactly this view of kinship that was brought by the colonizers to the African continent at the end of the 19th century. 
who also arrived in the former colony of Dalme, founded by decree in 1893. In its jurisdiction, was uh, its jurisdiction was composed, as in many colonies, by the establishment of a legal code modeled on the French system for people classified as civilized to be distinguished from the large majority of indigenous or indigenous. Like other British and French colonies in Africa, Dangme introduced two legal systems that applied until its independence in 1916. One of them based on the Code Napoleon held for the civilized, and the other, the Droit Indigène, the indigenous law has jurisdiction over the new category of the Indigene. So this Droit Indigène, the indigenous law, was initially thought of as a continuation of local juridical practices based on orally transmitted knowledge. During the early years of colonial rule, the French commandants asked local authorities, mainly the local chiefs, whom they integrated into the colon colonial administration as chefs, to act as judges. As these steps were being formalized, however, colonial authorities felt a need for codification. In 1931, therefore, the governor general of French West Africa in Dakar ordered to all governors to research and then codify indigenous law in their respective colonies in the form of a code of a code of customs for every colony. And interestingly, in the 16th century, similar things have been done uh, in France as well. So it's also interesting that they use an old uh, model of uh, codification by asking the local uh, population about their, or not the local population in the end, the elites uh, about their oral laws. So then was a questionnaire prepared in Dakar and sent to the governors of all the colonies in order to fill them out with local people. And even if the cotivier was supposed to be based on the collection of local customs, it was nevertheless strongly influenced by the French colonial interviewers and their categories. In Dalmay, the project was, was successfully carried out so that the cotivier de Dalmay was instituted in 1933. This first body of codified customary law in Dalmay was retaining following independence in 1916, despite the immediate abolition of the category of indigent, and it held until 1919 uh, and was used alongside the Code Napoleon for civil law case. It was not completely replaced until 2004 when the new Code de la Famille was adopted following years of intensive debate. So the migration of the term famille from French into local languages and also from Europe to um, uh, uh, colonial um, administration in the colony can, can be traced back to this Cotinier de Daume and possibly also to the questionnaire that was, was used in the survey and the questionnaires are, uh, do not exist anymore, unfortunately. So I would now look at the questionnaire itself, not, not at the questionnaire at the, at the quotidien, as well as, uh, as the body of law derived from it. Each uh, part uh, begins with a section titled De la Famille, on the family, that establishes la famille étendue, the extended family as the most important unit of social organization to which all households are subordinated. The quotidien de Daume, sees this family with its head as omnipresent and describes it as being divided into different subdivisions or branches, each with its own chef. The account of the structure of the family in Daume resembles the lineage system of the Nua as described in Evan Pritchard's classical model of the segmentary society. Similarly, segments and subdivisions are depicted in a very orderly and a very bureaucratic way. 
Looking at the ways La Famille et Tonville is characterized in subsequent parts of the Cotillier, leads us back to images of kinship in the 19th century and specifically to Morgan's systems of consanguinity and infinity. The path of marriage recalls another element of 19th century kinship theory. The Cotillier maintains that polygamy is slowly giving way to mono, monogamy uh, with the development of society. So each section comprises several paragraphs that address the various customs of the different ethnic groups. Thus, the Cotillier of the Dahomey systematically reproduces the anthropological knowledge of its time that family among the indigenous was generally shaped by marriage and destined that different systems of kinship are characteristic of different ethnic groups. And that, and finally, that these groups could be classified as states and stateless society. Hence, it is not only contributed to establishing and maintaining a view of the extended family as a basic model of social organization, but also contributed to an image of Africa made up of many ethnic groups, each organized principally on the basis of kinship. So the third part of the Cotillier, titled Filiation et Parenté, claims that patrilineality is the central feature of kinship structure all over the colonies' ethnic groups. As in the preceding section, the descriptions of legal norms of the family are based on European classifications, terms, and assumptions of kinship. As a result, destined is seen as based on biological processes of filiation that adopt, adoption can only supplant in exceptional case. So the questionnaire with its preconceived categories did not contain any open questions about local concepts that might open space for thinking about children's belongings in other ways, such as questions about the different people they addressed as father. In consequence, not, not so, such a practice is even mentioned in the Cotillier design. This becomes especially evident in the section on adoption. This is paragraphs 195 to 99. And I will now look at those paragraphs in a little bit more detail. The diverse customs are discussed along with classification of different purpose or ethnic groups, thus again demonstrating the principle of ethnic classifying. Um, or Benin and uh, my research region in northern Benin. And now you see here part of the Cotillier development. So if you, um, if you look at, uh, at this part on adoption, you see here again this kind of ethnic classification that uh, different ethnic groups are distinguished and uh, different uh, practices of adoption um, are uh, described in some of these ethnic groups, um, uh, adoption exists in case of impotence and others um, only within the same family and, uh, and so on. So you see uh, from these answers uh, that also uh, what is imagined as adoption is a kind is different. For instance, adoption within the same family is named with the same uh, term as adoption outside. And so these five paragraphs on the section of adoption offer insights into the argumentation of the Cotillier and its ways of classification. They are taken as seemingly so. Uh, uh, adoption is taken as a seemingly self-evident concept and is not defined at all. And uh, at the end, um, and I will not go in detail now to it, um, in the case of um, paragraph 198, Bariba, um, this is the longest uh, one, and this is uh, the area in which I did uh, my research. It is very obvious uh, from local sources that here, um, well, first it is say that it, it only exists when the spouses are childless. And then it is said that there are specific cases of adoption that uh, 
malformed children who are given uh, to the high chief, uh, and these children are then called in Kiriku. And um, on the basis of uh, local knowledge and local practices, um, it's clear that uh, this is a mixture of two different ways of circulating children. <laughs> One is uh, the circulation of um, children uh, who have uh, what is called here malformation, the children who had first the teeth growing, um, the upper teeth growing, which was seen as a sign of um, possible uh, witchcraft. And these children were given to Ulani Vergas. And there's another uh, way of giving children to the chief. Uh, and these, uh, the, the people called, uh, the, called Kiriku were children, former slave children, which were given to the high chief as a kind of messenger and became very prestigious person on the chief's court. So in fact, what we see here is a mixture of two very different um, local um, practices uh, combined in one and uh, called um, adoption. So uh, we see that a very broad and widespread phenomenon of giving children to relatives to be raised is not at all mentioned in the cotton year. It's just absolute used under adoption. Uh, this was possibly so ordinary that people did not perceive it as a special custom worth mentioning to be codified. But that again points out that the conceptual lens through which the colonizers investigated practices of non-birth parenting, raising children, was the European concept of uh, adoption, which did not fit at all to local practice. Obviously, this concept was not clear at all, either to those who asked the questions, nor to those who responded. However, even though the term adoption was not at all well known in the colony, it was also like family introduced into local arena. So to sum up, the Cotinier de Daume understands La Famille in terms of the categories within which Europeans imagine sociability in Africa. The extended family, La Famille et Famille, clearly divided into subgroups and regarded as a system of marriage and descent, was seen as the most important frame of reference. Other relationships between adults and children that were not based upon genealogical relationships were consequently called adoption producing a European distinction between biological and non-biological kinship. Kinship in this sense was seen as legitimating elements of customary law imagined as typical of indigenous or primitive societies, including bride service, bride crisis, and polygamy, and the assumption that it would give away to monogamy under the influence of the civilizing process. So I come to my next part, succession under colonialism. The political implications of the invention yeah, I'm good with time, of the famille étendue and its related hierarchies and classifications evoke the idea of an inseparable connection between kinship and politics in the field of local chieftaincy during the colonial time. French imageries of chieftaincy influenced decisions over succession after the death of local chiefs. For instance, French colonizers assumed that local chieftaincies passed like kingdoms in Europe from fathers to sons. However, chieftainship in Northern Dahomey had never passed directly from fathers to sons. First, they went to younger brothers or cousins of his chief and only passed to the eldest person from the next generation later, once nobody in the chief's generation remained available. Historical and anthropological research has shown that the integration of pre-colonial offices as chiefs into colonial administration went alongside important and multiple transformations. In Bartonu villages, local chieftaincy had existed before the French arrived. Complex but also flexible succession rules said that chiefs should be succeeded by members of particular lineages, which were said to have the right to the throne. In many of these chieftains, the right to succeed rotated between some lineages, 
for it was Tanit were never supposed to follow immediately after their birth father. Conversations about local memories and colonialism confirm that some actors were certainly aware of the French view that sons should succeed their father. Therefore, some local chiefs ensured that their office would pass to a nephew or foster son after their death by emphatically describing him as their natural child, which was easily done since there was no linguistic distinction between the two anyway. So they produced an image of local kinship that satisfied the needs of the French and at the same time served their own interests. Stories of clever tricks used to circumvent colonial succession rules are still present in village storytelling. But outwardly, they adopted European conceptions and terminology with the result that the European categories were reproduced willy-nilly and thus gradually accepted. So in general, such, such, such practices stabilized the idea of the family as legitimating hereditary rule. Not, at least, not least, they shaped the political practice of hereditary rule based on European image, images. It is interesting that this idea of a tribal other who had to be integrated into the colonial structures in order to be kept under control was sometimes reinforced by local actors who could not depend on local support and legitimation. And I have uh, one story about um, man who had been a former slave then entered uh, into a colonial services as a cook and then a policeman and then he managed to convince the French uh, to become a chef de village in one village against uh, local rules of course and then some years later uh, he introduced his son uh, to become his, his successor again. So stories like this are commonly regarded by historians and also anthropologists as evidence of modifications or innovations in chieftaincy by colonial rulers in West Africa. Up to now, however, little attention has to be given to the way they also shaped and maybe even invented notions of kinship. The, the story could also be read as such an introduction of kinship for former slaves and at the same time, the confirmation of European ideas about succession and inheritance. Indeed, the French understanding of La Famille embraced the idea that every man, even a slave and every woman, had a name and with it a family and had the right to pass that name and possibly associated rights to his sons and daughters. So in communication with the colonizers, vernacular understandings of relations that anthropologists would call kinship relations, which more important led to local rules of succession, were often concealed. And this explains why succession rules that privileged nephews and younger brothers as successors remained widely unknown in French. So I come now to vernacular concepts. So if it can be accepted that the term famille was introduced by the French, the question arises as to what local terms um, were used earlier to denominate uh, significant relations of collectivity. There are older terms, of course, but the first thing that needs to be noted is that knowledge of social relations and the positioning of every person were and often still are conceived in the region as also depending on age and status. So, okay. I will now um, start with the first uh, local term. When I started uh, to do reach, uh, research in the research and I asked uh, about local terms for kinship or for family, I was quite often given the term Meru Bilzigu which could be translated as mother's people, which I found surprising because in a patrilinear society. And uh, later on, I came to understood that this was the term that was not a pre-colonial term, but it was invented by um, Christian missionaries when they needed a translation for um, community. So you 
Those of you who are familiar with the Bible know that every um, paragraph when Jesus asked, uh, speaks started with my people and then such and such. And this my people was uh, by the Catholic priest, uh, Catholic priest, but also by the Protestant pastors constantly uh, uh, the term Meru Vizigu, so mother's people was used. So it, um, it is not at all an old term as well, but it is very popular and it's also in the local radio constantly used as kinship. Then uh, we have uh, the word Manu, which could be translated as destined, which uh, comes from the verb Mara, to give birth, which is uh, used in a very wide sense uh, if, um, yeah, for, for, for destined, but uh, also men can talk, uh, can use um, the term Mara, giving birth, so it's not linked to women and also uncles and wider kin can use uh, Manu just to, um, to say that this person is their descendant. Um, then we have the term Boiseru, which could be translated as species, race, time, and is also used for non-human species. So one would also talk about different Boiseru races of, of cows or uh, chicken or what uh, as animals and also of spe species of mice, but it is also very much used in uh, in 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 the context of humanity. And if, when I am asked what is my Boisero, people would expect me to say I'm German. And then there is the word Tomaru, which is, uh, could be translated as praise. So this is what. Uh, Rios, praising us, are using when they are telling also the stories of kinship relations uh, publicly in order to explain how a, who a person is. This is especially used in funerals and uh, but also in marriages um, where kinship relationships should be expressed and also transmitted uh, to the next uh, generation. But as you see, none of these terms. Uh, is um, covers all that uh, family covers. And one of these terms is, say, uh, could be a um, translation of this um, very much more generalizing um, term. So I come now to my last and concluding part. Um, in this paper, I have uh, reconstructed, at least in some pieces, how the concept of the imagined remedy for the less civilized rest, as James Ferguson called it, was invented in colonial Dahomey. Following the compilation of the Cotumier de Dahomey, colonizers and locals used the French term famille to express the idea of the extended family as it as it had continued to be used as a colonial and post-colonial imagery about the webs of relation. Even if it, this is imagined as an ancient part of so-called African culture and projected into a supposed eternal past, it is a new concept, like the Mero Bicibu, created by colonial epistemologies, imaginations, and practice. It has become firmly established in the way colonial officers and Europeans saw and there was governed the population in the colony. Today, in line with Ferguson, the notion of the extended family and its inherent networks of solidarity allows the state to neglect to care for the whole, whole of its citizens, reserving access to social security to a small minority of people and leaving the large majority to, to depend on the extended family perpetuates in a way colonial classification. And I have to add that in the uh, Beninese family law, it is expressly said that the extended family is the, the first caretaker for the elderly, for instance. So this is the way I think how it reproduces in law. Due to pronounced economic instability and the lack of formal security systems, new imaginations about the extended family are arising. 
to introduce by colonial officers in the colony of Daume. For me, was disseminated through colonial practices of codification and everyday administration. And I did not mention and analyze all, of course, in this paper. Um, <clears throat> An important part of it is the name giving that everybody needs a family name to be registered. So for me entered the local languages and became a general term bridging linguistic difference. One could even argue that the dissemination of Fami has become part of a national language of doing kinship through practices of governing and registering, greeting and explaining. If you say la Fami, it is also something that everybody in the country understands, talking your, your language or not. So I'm of course here alluding on the invention of imagined traditions as well as to Mudimba's famous invention of Africa, and of course also on the invention of chief city. These citations are examples of the intensive debates during the last decades of the 20th century concerning the invented character of institutions in the political arena, such as kingdoms and chieftains, and the immense transformations colonial rule effected in local political organization. However, there has still not been a similarly intense debate on the conceptual and linguistic transformations and inventions around kinship and the family. So far, I have neglected to explain why FAMI has become such a frequently used and well appropriated term in contemporary Berlin. From the establishment of the colony, the French authorities required people to register under a nom de famille, a family name, whether it was for a passport, a birth certificate, or enrollment in missionary and later in nation, national schools. This went hand in hand with the process of establishing fixed names during the 20th century. And this the fixation of names is very, very important. Uh, even if it seems uh, obvious today, and the idea of a family that is represented in the family name and inseparable connected with everyday person's life and identity has become part of general knowledge, it is worth remembering that this process of establishing, fixing, and thus eternalizing family names is still an unfinished and ongoing process. But together with the bureaucratization of governance, the nom de famille has become indispensable for schooling, military service, apprenticeship, formal employment, and social security. And now comes my last paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> Today, that wording is attractive also for another reason. Fami is well known among speakers of various languages. So even if uh, Batonu are sometimes asked to name their Tamaru or their Boiseru, depending on the linguistic um, pro, um, abilities of the person who asks, it has, it has become easier to use the term Fami throughout the country, since it is understood by everyone, not only those who share the same language, but also the anthropologist who does not know anything. It is useful in everyday communication situation. It is a handy term that will even be understood by somebody who comes from far away, like me, for instance. And I think in the course of the far-reaching changes that are currently taking place, it is not certain if all the other terms mentioned uh, will survive at all. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Albert. So um, I hope you all agree that this was an amazing presentation with me. Um, and we are going to... Um, Without further ado, we're gonna open it up to questions um, so that we can have about 30 minutes of um, dialogue and discussion and thinking about this notion of family being a colonial construct. Um, so we're gonna go, we'll come to the room. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand and then we'll come online. So for our colleagues online, please pop your hand up. 
Um, and so we'll do one, one, we'll take three questions, um, let our presenter respond, and then we will move from there. So I think we have one in the room. And while you present, can you please introduce yourself and who you represent? Uh, so we know who is speaking. For those online, please raise your hand and we'll identify you based on those who raised their hand first. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Sidek Schumann. I'm working at the Yasa Institute here at the University of Ghana, but I'm not sure if I represent it. Um, my question is, Edmund, as you, um, the title of your um, lecture is Decolonizing the Extent of Family in West Africa. I would be interested in your understanding of decolonization. And um, if you like, think of decolonization from the end or a possible end, what would you say, what should happen or what must be happen that you would say, okay, now the extended family is decolonized, now it's done. Is there some criteria or some, you know, some like possibility to think this from the end or is it like rather an ongoing process that never ends or how do you see it? We're gonna take three questions so that you can respond, yeah. Okay, do we have anyone? Thank you so much, Felix, for that. Um, do you have do we have anyone online? We have two uh, comments. Uh, Professor Koshwaro Makompopo said she's sorry that she had to leave. Um, she thanks you um, and she enjoyed your paper. And new questions have emerged uh, about social security and philanthropy. Um, that she'll take up, right? Um, and then uh, Jacqueline Bethel, the last name is not coming through well. Thank you for the great presentation. Other comments in the room? Oh, Jacqueline, please. Jacqueline, open your mic. Jacqueline Bethel Montague, can you open your mic and speak, please? Please, Jacqueline, can we hear you? Can you hear me? We can. The floor is yours. And Ruth, hey, thank you so much for this really enlightening presentation. Um, my question has to do with the uh, ants and uncles in the fostering system. Um, how does the extended family get, re, get restructured in terms of how aunts and uncles are also seen? I think about my own family where on my mom's side, I have 12 uncles and aunts. My uncle raised my mother um, and I see him as my um, grandfather. Um, and as a grandfather to my child. And so it provides um, sort of, I guess, uh, what do you call it? So security when you have family, like direct family members who may, um, you know, die and pass on, you have other fathers and, you know, other mothers and so on. Thank you. And Jacqueline, thank you for that comment. Um, Jacqueline, did you want to tell us who you represent or where, what institution you're from? Oh, yes, I'm also a Miasa Fellow. Woohoo! You're welcome. Miasa Fellows are in the house. All right, any other comments in the room? We've got another comment in the room. Where's our mic, please? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Eyo uh, Mensa. I'm a Miasa Fellow. Yeah, my question is on the concept of uh, adoption. And uh, you say that uh, the adopter cannot benefit from the inheritance of the adopter. Does it mean that if I am adopted, I can still benefit from the inheritance of my direct family or I belong neither here nor there? That's my question, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's take a fourth question in the room. I know. And then those online, we're gonna to come to you first. So um, get your ready, your questions after our presenter speaks. Yes, please. Hello, Gretchen Bauer, also a Miyasa Fellow. Um, so I'm always very troubled by the use of the concept of local. Um, and I don't know if other people are as well. I mean, it just you know reinforces the idea that you are an outsider and of course you are an outsider. So maybe it's you know reminding us all of that, right? But you know, the all the time you had that slide on display, I'm thinking, what language is the local language? What language is it? If the language has a name. I would like to know what language it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one can always substitute another word for local. One never has to use the word local. 
you can say Africans, you can say Dahomeanians, I don't know what the plural is for people from the Dahomey. Um, you know, you can, the people of that ethnic group. Yeah. I just, I, I just feel very strongly about that. And I think that's very important. I would like your reaction to that. Yeah. Great. And let me add one more thing so that you can add an additional thing, because it comes to this local thing. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to this notion of culture and how culture is not stagnant, right? It's dynamic. Um, and as people interact with others, um, culture transforms, it transmits, and it, it, and, it, and it may look differently. So I'm wondering, can you take in, do you have anything that you can take into account uh, of that sort of transform this concept of kinship in Dahomey, right? That predates this 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 inter interaction with the colonial uh, structure. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, many questions, and uh, in a way, I see them all <laughs> related. And uh, I think one could even try to answer all. <laughs> In one answer to uh, Felix, uh, who asked uh, me, what if uh, you would think of uh, decolonization from the end? But I will not dare to try a completely um, integrated answer. Felix, when I uh, reread uh, my paper that I had uh, written, or parts of it, a um, um, little bit earlier uh, today in the morning, uh, in order to, to get into the flow <laughs> of this presentation, I also stumbled about the title of its title, and I was asking myself, shouldn't I have better named it Recolonizing the Extended Family? Yeah, Because in a way, uh, my argument is that uh, this concept has emerged in Dahomey in, uh, with a colonial rule. Yeah, and not earlier. It was it did not ex it exist earlier. And uh, to come to the end, uh, part of my answer uh, to your question would be: Now it is so deeply in uh, the everyday communications, yeah, that uh, it would be absurd to to criticize anybody and say, "Well, you should not use family because it is a colonial concept." Yeah, because the ways how people are today talking about the family is is of course also some uh, a little bit far away from um, how the colonizers imagined uh, the African extended family. So, what I, do I want to say with this answer? I do not think that anything could be uh, looked at from the end, and historians should know that because everything is uh, in constant uh, con um, transformations. And I mean, I uh, introduced here um, quite often to answer parts of uh, Gretchen's uh, question. Others are talking about vernacular concepts. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid this ethnic classification. I could, of course, have, have said Bartonu concept. In, but I find uh, then uh, it also problematic uh, because even the language of Bartonum is not only spoken by people who would call themselves Bartombu. Yeah? So this would also be um, troubling. Yeah? And uh, so with the introduction of what if not local concept, I could say a concept that exists in the Bartonum language um, here. I wanted to show that these concepts themselves also have a history. Yeah. And some of these histories can be reconstructed, as I did with the Meru Bisibu, which is uh, which are Bartonum words, but which were uh, invented uh, by those who, tr who translated the Bible. And it took me 20 years to find it out. Yeah. So I'm very sure that also with the other concepts, one could uh, trace these histories if one would find uh, sources to tell this story. And I'm very sure that um, in the future, uh, that is, it will be an ongoing process. And I would not be very surprised uh, if uh, people would uh, make clearer distanci differentiations between 
extended kin and nuclear kin and things like that in the future. And if uh, that would also be mirrored in a way um, in the language. Uh, what I find interesting uh, with the extended uh, family is that it is so um, such an open term that it could uh, get many meanings, actually. So that was um, a kind of answer uh, to Felix. Uh, so social security and philanthropy, um, uh, Professor Akosua Adomako is, of course, uh, very, very important. And uh, I would also say, of course, this idea of uh, the state having to be the provider of social security systems has not always uh, been there, has its own history. And uh, of course, this uh, new wave of philanthropy, which uh, try to transform even social security networks alongside their own criteria is something that we have to observe very critically. And uh, that also sh shows, of course, that these um, global influences um, and global um, movements like the uh, global philanthropist is something that uh, intensively influences what happens here, mm -hmm. but uh, also vice versa. So Jacqueline, um, aunts and uncles in fostering systems. I would not speak about fostering systems, but of uh, fostering practices that are also constantly changing. I've written my monograph on the history of child fostering, in which I also showed that the pattern and the practices have been changed a lot during the 20th century, that schooling, for instance, has enormously transformed it, and uh, that aunts and uncles have even become, uh, in some contexts, more important than before because of schooling and because of the need uh, to for children to find places in urban households. And when the parents are living in the village, then maybe the aunts and uncles are uh, preferred. Um, posts uh, for children. And you raised very nicely uh, the question that, uh, of course, the notion or the concept of aunts and uncles is, again, a European one. And in many uh, languages here, there is not no distinction between the father and the father's brother. So in a way, father and uh, father's brother um, could not so easily be called as father and uncle. That would again be uh, the reproduction of um, Euro American um, kinship classifications. And uh, yeah, Professor Mensa, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for your uh, question on adoption. I, I think I, I tried to demonstrate that uh, adoption, as in it was invented by the French uh, in Dahomey, did not. Uh, was not useful at all to classify these uh, or to categorize these different ways of uh, transmissions of uh, children. Yeah, that it, is, it was in a way not the right uh, category. Um, well, what I have learned from the literature, but also from my own research, that uh, very broadly speaking, uh, in Benin, but also in Ghana. And in Ghana, we have the pioneering work on this field. Uh, I mean, it started with Esther Goody and uh, many other scholars have followed uh, to, to look at child uh, circulation here in, in Ghana. <coughs> they always made this difference between adoption and fostering by arguing that in the case of fostering, not all rights are transmitted from the natal parents to the foster parents. Whereas in adoption, it is the case. So this is the classical distinction between adoption and um, uh, and fostering. If you look in, into European adoption laws and also in the International Convention of Adoption, adoption is always described as a, as a transfer of a child's belonging in which all paternal and maternal rights are transferred to the adoption parent. Yeah. So if I adopt a child, the child has the same right as my biological children and so on. And um, 
In, on the African continent, there were many, I now try not to use local, many practices in different uh, places, in different regions, uh, in different ethnic groups, which all transformed over time, uh, in which uh, there were many ways of transferring rights in children, but also rights of children um, partially, yeah? So a child could then, for instance, quite often the foster parents have the right to marry a child when they still have the right to marry children, but the children would maybe not inherit from them. Yeah. So uh, here I think it is very useful to look very carefully on the different uh, modes and relationships between the birth parent and the foster parent and also it's also a question of time if children are permanently situated in another household and uh, meant to be belong to another person or, or only temporarily. So I hope, so I tried to answer Gretchen um, and I will uh, force myself in the future, thank you for that, not to use the concept of local. Um, I see also uh, many, implications and I think it's a good um, good argument. I mean, the problem is really that we have to use a language that people still understand. And I think the, the approach of um, being aware and Sometimes it, it leads to very uh, complicated uh, ways of explaining as well. So that brings me to my last, to the last point, the notion of culture. I have to say that I was trained um, as a social, trained as an anthropologist. I have learned from the beginning that one should never use the concept of culture, which I respect uh, until today. Uh, fully acknowledging that uh, advanced uh, theories of culture, of course, imply an understanding of culture, which um, implies constant change and of also um, uh, different ways of influencing from one place to another and uh, so on. Um, however, um, I would still um, think that everything that could be described as culture could also be, descri be described uh, with terms like social practice, uh, norms, meanings, and so on. But I think this is also a little bit a question of different um, lines of thinking. Thank you so much for those comments. We're going to go online, but before we go online, I'm going to um, take liberty of, of, of the chairship and just respond to this notion of culture. Sekou Ture in Revolution Culture and Pan-Africanism says that culture is a totality of a people, right? And so I think the, 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 the question really is this notion, ultimately in how you answered it, around, you know, is there agency in African people's um, understanding of kinship or family that predated colonial, uh, the colonial construct? Um, unless I, I misread or misheard the, uh, the presentation, it, it was very much centered on Nanakuya, uh, ready yourself because we're coming. Um, it was very much centered on family being a colonial construct and being introduced into Dahomey and as if there was nothing that was similar uh, prior to the colonials entering the scene, right? Um, and so that was, that's really my, my question, you know, what in the heck was happening prior to when the colonialists came, uh, you know? So, um, and then also, you know, thinking about culture as a totality of a people, their language, their economics, their political systems, their you know their interactions internally. Nana Akuya, please open your mic and ready yourself. We're ready to hear your presentation or your not your presentation, your question, please. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Dov, and thank you also for the very good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, 
I have two questions um, I would like to ask about, Excuse first of all, sorry, about this. Can you please, who are you, please? We don't know who you are. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, I'm a master student at the East African Studies. Um, yes, so I think that should be enough. Thank you. Right. So I um, wanted to ask about the adoption um, point where you said when a rebellious child or well-formed child in your presentation is sent to the high chief to be raised as part of their family and then they are called a kiliku um, you spoke about how they are allowed to be treated as legitimate children and so i wanted to ask if the they have um if they are given succession rights um even though um, they are adopted or if you you use the other term that like you are being raised by the chief were they allowed succession rights and if they were how did the biological children or family take this and what were the social structures that were put in place to um, allow for peaceful cooperation yeah, so that would be my first question and the second question i know you said you were presenting from a historical perspective and per historicization you are supposed to give an account of what happened, what the people did. But then also I'd like to ask you from your scholarly view, linking this to your topic on decolonization. Um, so knowing very well that the term for family or family came from the French and also the categorization process, also from the church and the Christianity and blah, blah, blah. Um, how would you say decolonization of the term could okay or what happened what could be some of the processes that could be put in place for a decolonization process in other not for the term to be used as a metaphor that does not have any practical means of achievement or attainment so how would you say in your opinion a decolonization somewhat of a minute form or however or of a radical form whatever could okay um with a term um the whole family system of the Dahomey people. So thank you very much. Nana Kwe, thank you so much. And you neglected to mention that you are currently at the University of Freiburg doing in, the, in, in a project um, on decolonization. So that was a very important point that you should have mentioned um, so that people understand and, and can situate your question well. Um, other questions in the room and other questions online. We have two questions in the room. Our mic representative, please. Online, please raise your hand. We'll come back to you before we go to the speaker. First question right uh, in the front. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this amazing presentation. I don't know if it's a real question or just anything similar about a lot of things. The first one is that I was really surprised because in Mali, where I work, uh, in Baba, we, we don't show this uh, French notion of my family. It's still in Baba. I mean, in the region, I've never heard about it. So I was wondering, yes, uh, what specific, what make this notion in, uh, difficult to say, but uh, but linked to this question also, uh, um, uh, when we talk about, uh, 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 yes, I have two questions in my mind, I try to answer <laughs> it too. Um, when we, uh, yeah, there's a uh, example, it was, uh, when we talk about family, um, if that's uh, an extended family, which is an extended family, is it just, you talk about some use in the language, I think, but in the practice, uh, because I've just a, a book about uh, how uh, people and fathers in particular have to make the family exist, like uh, maintaining relationships, uh, going, sending the, the children to, to ceremony. So, if they don't do this practice, it doesn't exist and it's, um, they get some problems. So I was wondering if there was, if it was just a, a, a language use, of, there was also some practice like that. And my third point was about uh, this colonization, decolonization issue. I'm not really not a specialist, but I always wondering uh, where does it start? Because it's like, um, we talk about colonization, but uh, uh, 
and, and also with the beginning of, of uh, uh, anthropology, we start with colonization, but uh, I mean, for example, in France, there was also anthropology uh, starting in the same period, and there was a relationship between urban and rural, and there is also this uh, practice to say that the, the rural people were not civilized and with the industrialization they have to control people and, and then and so on. So I was wondering where does it start and if there was like a similar story with the notion of family in 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 Germany or in France. I don't know if I'm uh, historians in the room but it, it, I mean it's not your field but I was wondering so thank you very much. And please, we have a question back here. And uh, ready yourself online if anyone has a question, please. Thank you also for my slide, I'm Yasa. Um, I have more some linguistic question. I'm not a linguist, sorry, but. Um, please, I, I'm sorry, can you speak up? We can't hear you well. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so the one, very small question, Mero, I, I can't help. I, I have the feeling that Meryl comes from, from French, Mer. So I um, just wondered about the linguistic background and what is the concrete meaning of this word. And this brings me also to another question because you, if I understand right, you try to find some terms which may reflect kind of kinship or relatives or family in Batonum. Uh, but I wanna like, more about the broader linguistic field, and if some of these uh, terms in Batonum can also reflect some imaginations, what, how, how relations between female, uh, different people are um, conceived. Um, I think of myself a Wolof in, in, in Senegal, where the wife is always called the uh, owner of the room and the husband is the owner of the house. So I, I just wonder if, if, if these kind of uh, meanings in terms can also provide some additional understanding. Thank you. And we have one last question. I think um, mine goes directly to the title and the presentation that was just given. In fact, I must acknowledge it's a wonderful one. And thank you for that. So I'm wondering, um, the data actually comes from Dahomey and the title we have West Africa. So I'm wondering if perhaps some other research has been done in other West African countries for thus in quote generalization. And uh, talking about Ghana, for instance, I know when we talk about family, we have indigenous terminologies for that. So the Akans, for instance, who see Ibusia, and they would have terminologies for the various family members. And in my language, for instance, we would say Budi. And when I say Budi, in fact, it encompasses every member of the extended family. And I can again relate to my father's brother, my mother's sister, etc. So I'm wondering uh, why West Africa, when perhaps the data is coming from Gabon, has other things been done around the West African countries? Thank you. And um, please, uh, seminar coordinator, are we closing after this? What's our close time, please? Okay, so um, I'll, any last questions online before we close? We don't want to disenfranchise anyone online. Any of our great uh, presenters online, please? Um, Raise your hand now. I'll give you 30. Ah, Jonathan. Okay, Jonathan, please ask a question so that we can hear you well, and then we will turn it over to our speaker. Jonathan, open your mic and raise your question and remind us who you are, please. Hello, Jonathan. Can you hear us? Please, Jonathan, open your mic. Okay. Can uh, you yes, please. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Jonathan. I am a, a PhD student and I'm studying here in uh, uh, Germany. Uh, I'm working in the field of uh, heritage studies. Okay, so mine is a very brief question. Um, Prof, you mentioned griots. Uh, the griot tradition, as, a, as far as I know, they are local historians. So have you investigated their account? Uh, hello, Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan. 
Please, can you start again? We've lost you. Okay, sorry. Okay, Thank so, you. Yeah, uh, Prof mentioned uh, griots in the presentation. So I'm only wondering if she has investigated uh, how the griots uh, operate the historical information that they keep and uh, if she has been able to retrieve some understanding of family constructs you know, from them. Please, thank you, Jonathan. So we're gonna hand it back to our presenter who will do a final uh, response and a closing at the same time. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, really for very great and inspiring, not so easy to, uh, to be answered uh, questions, but this is exactly what I, uh, like. So first uh, to you, thank you very much that you repeated your question. I have only, uh, I just took the, uh, the concept of culture in my first answer. And of course, uh, there is an agency of uh, African people, there has been an agency, and not only an agency, but uh, also changing practices, practices and agencies. And everything um, it is very hard to reconstruct um, changes uh, and transformations, say 200 years ago, if you don't have sources and very often you have only European sources. Therefore, I started uh, my own study on child fostering, just to give you one ex example, in the 19th century, just before colonialism, because uh, memory, and I collected lots of um, memories of very old people as one source of my material, uh, and I could not uh, get um, further than in the back. But everything that we know is that the 19th century was a, a time of intensive transformation in, in my research region uh, because of um, the expansion of the Fulani states in northern Nigeria, which implied um, seemingly, if one can trust the, some sources, in enormous intensifications of, of violent actions, raids, feuds, and so on. And what I could reconstruct is that uh, the exchange of children, the circulation of children, has been a very established praxis already before, which what we can see if we trace lines of uh, who um, of chiefs of a of a village and and there, uh, for several reasons, uh, practices of child, child fostering are very important. Um, I cannot go in deep detail, but it is very important to understand that. And I, I think that the whole political history is intensively entangled with practices of uh, circulating children. Yeah, And this is an agency, and this has uh, adapted to new political and economic needs constantly, and I would see that as a constant agency until today. I give you just one example in the 19th century, seemingly, if I can trust uh, uh, this, the few sources, it was intensively used to create kinds of client networks all over the places, if possible. So the children were given away to kin, which was far away, not to the direct uncle, not to father's brother, but uh, to say um, father's um, large cousin or something like that, yeah? And then uh, one had, uh, one created, connected this with different places. And, uh, it was said by uh, my uh, interlocutors and friends that uh, when colonial rule came and uh, the region became more peaceful, although there was another kind of violence, but the raids and feuds stopped, People started uh, to take children and to give children not to uh, people who were situated far away, but more closer. Yeah. So, uh, and then there was another transformation with the introduction of schooling because people needed uh, places for their children um, in town. Yeah. And then there was a kind of new practice uh, that the children were given uh, to wealthier middle class households. And, uh, could be traced already until the colonial time. And then again, it changed because these households no longer gave children back yeah, uh, for economic reasons. So, so I can, and as I have written a book uh, on it, I could 
talk long time how this um, pre-colonial practice that had nothing to do with European influences has uh, constantly changed, always uh, in relation to changing economies, changing political, but it also shaped, I would also always say, also the political sphere. And this is for me an excellent example of what you would call agency of African people, yeah, which I would not situate uh, in before colonialism, yeah, but which is an ongoing uh, thing. And yesterday we have heard even a brilliant paper of a colleague who's, who showed how uh, some Europeans uh, be, became part of the picture in the 19th century. And so, so maybe that suffices. Uh, now I come to the uh, legitimate children in the Kiriku. Um, it was a question of uh, in the Zoom. Um, here I have, have to go into details. As I said, the Kiriku is a very specific form. I would even not necessarily subsume under child fostering or adoption. It was a kind of taking out of the families or of the households of the of the slaves and later now it is the household of the former slaves which is also an interesting story young men who would then tra be transformed tra trans transferred to the household of the of the chief and they are kinds of his messengers which was seemingly a very prestigious um task and also a kind of um, symbolic uprising of people from the former slaves uh, families, but this has nothing had nothing to do that they became a sort of legitimate children of the chief. Yeah, all this imagery uh, is only in in the Kotiyedaume, uh, seemingly not. So then um, there was the question which I find very intriguing. What could uh, reflecting decolonization help? And uh, yes, of course, decolonization has become really a buzzword for many uh, different things. In fact, I uh, think that we have to be aware and it, that it makes a lot of sense to trace the, the history and the changing uh, understandings of concepts like kinship, like family, like uh, adoption and so on. And the first thing that could help would be to be aware what I say if I use these concepts. So this is the kind of, of epistemological decolonization if one wants, yeah? The other thing would be uh, just to learn and to be aware that many practices that we uh, see as um, completely normal these days have their own history. Yeah? And I would here, of course, include um, education. And this is not enough, not, not sufficiently researched until now. How do, um, for instance, a Euro American concept of childhood uh, traveled uh, to the African continent and, of course, brought new alliances, new understanding, uh, and so on. Yeah, the question also of uh, child protection um, could uh, be discussed um, also with different uh, layers of understanding, I would say. So, I I think uh, reflecting uh, about decolonization in this. Uh, sense is a kind of enlightening process, uh, just to become more cautious about uh, the ways how we conceptualize uh, society in general. Yes, and I would always think that that must and should have political implications. There are, of course, other understandings of decolonization which are much more practical, which I do not uh, follow in this uh, talk, um, but which are not excluded at all. Okay, Laure, thank you very much for your comment. Um, I'm amazed uh, that, and, and this is also the question, why do you talk about uh, um, decolonizing the extended family in West Africa? At the beginning of my talk, I have said that 
in my perception, there is not enough sufficient uh, research at all, and that one has to start in order not to, to reproduce cliches with, with very concrete cases, yes? And I can only talk about uh, the language I know, which is Bartonum and so on. Uh, and I am always uh, very happy to get uh, uh, information uh, about uh, other regions, yes? And this is also, at the beginning, I have said this is the task of the anthropologist to start, start with your concrete example in that, and then ask, well, Guys, could you tell me something about Ghana? And then it becomes interesting. So uh, thank you also. Uh, and I have to, I find it intriguing that you say that uh, La Famille is not so common in, in Mali when I presented it in, in here. And also this notion if it entered in the local language or not. I found it interesting that people are very often greeting me at Batonu. People are very often greeting me to say Hunim Famili, which is a mixture of family and, and a local term, yeah? And others say Ila Fami and so on. Good. Then, uh, Suzanne, yes. I asked that, I asked myself and linguists for a long time if Meru has nothing to do with uh, mother. It's the same with Sesu, which means Sister, if it is talk said by a man, he uses sesu, or it is uh, if women say sesu, it is the brother, so it is the the other sex uh, sibling, so to say, and this is sesu. And I always thought that sister, and it was even easier for me to learn the terms meru and sesu because it resembles. But lingo is says that no, so um, I don't uh, know. But in any case, you are very right, and that therefore I also mentioned that uh, all kinds of kinship relations are also determined by age, uh, situatedness, uh, but also uh, by the person who speaks, um, and uh, these hints to places and to conceptions of places are very uh, present. Not so much is if I see right in the terms in Batonum, but in the phrases. So very often when you talk about uh, a spouse, then there comes uh, afterwards uh, a word for the room after it. So I think it is a little bit similar. And I think that, and then we are again at the question of African agency. <laughs> um, if this is a completely different study, of course, from what I'm presenting here, but a study which I find very important and I, I, I'm always collecting in that sense, because, and this is also a general answer to many of the questions here, I think that we should, uh, in if we take this decolonization series, we should really think through terms in African languages and ways of seeing and describing the relationships um, in order to get out of the uh, categories. And yes, there has been, you, I think, asked it um, in both kinship and family have also their own history in, in, in Europe, yeah? And familia is an old ancient Ro Roman term and kinship was invented in the 16th century in in, in, in Kinship in in uh, in the English language and uh, a little bit later, Verwandtschaft is a German term as well. Both all these terms are not eternal, yes, and have their own um, moment when they emerged. And of course, uh, in and this is also part of the divide between anthropology and sociology. What is the difference between kinship and family? It's a sociology that used family and anthropology that used kinship. And kinship has been much more linked to this idea of traditional societies. And quite often it was even made this difference between kinship and primitive societies and family in modern societies and so on. So there's many, there's a lot of anthropological and historical um, reflections on that, or not a lot, but there. Uh, yes, I could uh, recommend you the book, The Politics of Making Kinship, edited by myself, together with historians 
this year 2023, which is very recent, and there is found that answered these questions. Also, the introduction of kinship with the end of slavery in the in the uh, in the early um, Middle Age in Europe, which is also a very interesting process. There's an article that argues that with the liberation of slaves, there was this idea that everybody has kinship independent from things, which uh, was introduced also in, in, in Europe, which was also not, an, not existing before. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think, no, Jonathan's question about the griots. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did uh, this research. I cannot talk in length about it, uh, but I think, um, Yes, it is. It is uh, an important um, aspect how Rios and our praising are also repeating and uh, transforming uh, these ideas about related. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that I have more or less and, uh, answered all these complicated questions. And I could just say again, thank you very much for these very much uh, thoughtful questions. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure you all will agree with me again that the, uh, Professor Alber has done an amazing job. We let's thank her. I didn't, I didn't hear the thanks, so let's thank her much louder and much more exciting, please. Thank you. Um, I um, it was a pleasure moderating this seminar, and I'm going to turn it back to our seminar. All right, thank you very much. So just once again, I want to say a very big thank you for Balva for making time to be with us. We really enjoy your presentation and we hope to see you back very soon. And to Dr. Njiba, thank you for allowing me to pull you in without even having some break. And uh, next week we have another presentation and uh, this conference hall will be occupied. And so a seminar will be held in the senior members common room, which is uh, on the ground floor. And this would be done by Dr. Ahmed Badawi Mustafa, who is the fellow of the Institute of African Studies. And his topic is titled, Revisiting Pacifist Tradition in West African Islam Amid, Amidst Rising Tides of Militant Jihadism. So please make time to be with us, it has to be jihadism, Islam, and West Africa. And I think it promises to be a very exciting one. So once again, let me say a very big thank you. And please, I uh, have a simple or an announcement. Uh, we often share YouTube videos of our seminars and we would like you all to subscribe to the YouTube channel. So anytime you receive the video, just kindly go down and press the button so that you'll be a subscriber to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much once again. Yes, sure, both. Yeah, thank you, Edmund and... Uh... You?